Thanks everyone for coming on a very cold Friday afternoon. Um, but it's going to get uh, warmer, intellectually, I hope, anyway, um, in a few minutes, uh, because we have a very exciting speaker today. So um, my name is Heidi Matthews. I am an assistant professor of law uh, here at Osgoode Hall Law School. Um, and I co-organize along with professors Palma Pachoco and uh, Francois tanguy um, a speaker series, this is our inaugural year, the speaker series is called Emerging Trends in Criminal Justice. And part of the goal of that series uh, is really to engage with some of the most pressing questions facing criminal justice today um, in a cross-jurisdictional and also cross-disciplinary fashion. And so um, it's really in that particular vein that, that we thought Chase would be a fantastic speaker. Um, and he's going to speak to us today on reforming the U.S. criminal justice system, shrinkage or expansion, which is uh, quite a title. <laughs> um, so just a brief bio, Chase uh, is a lawyer and a journalist uh, based in New York City. I think he's been dedicated, I think this is fair to say, over his career to furthering um, the progressive discourse on social justice issues um, both in the U.S. but also globally, um, and from a, a strongly critically informed perspective. Um, he's the author of The Passion of Chelsea Manning, the story behind the WikiLeaks whistleblower um, published by Verso Books. Um, he's contributed to The New York Times, The Guardian, The London Review of Books, The Nation, American Conservative. Which I can explain. Which, well, I think that's wonderful. And J Jacobin and, and, and a host of other venues. I can venues. explain those two. That's what yeah. <laughs> I can explain all of them, yeah. <laughs> so, Chase is, uh, is a graduate of Stanford and, and the NYU Law School, um, and he's lectured widely um, all over uh, on issues pertaining to, to criminal justice in general. Um, and he's currently teaching what looks to be a fascinating course on law and war uh, at the Gallatin School at NYU. Um, and so I think what we're going to do is have Chase speak for like approximately 30 minutes and then open it up for a Q&A. Um, this is obviously being recorded, so bear that in mind um, when it comes to your uh, interventions. Um, and yeah, take it away, Chase. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Professor Heidi Matthews, for organizing a great talk for me. And thanks so much to the Jack and May Nathanson Center and the wonderful speaker series that they are supporting, and to Osgood Hall and to all of you for showing up on a Friday afternoon. Uh, I'm just going to talk for about half an hour uh, about criminal justice reform in the United States. My apologies for something that is very US-centric, but there will be many peripheral glances and occasional longing gazes to other countries. And I hope in the discussion afterwards, anyone will bring up ex relevant experiences from Canada or from any other country whose criminal justice system you are familiar with, because we need comparisons. Uh, I'm sometimes told, well, that's apples and oranges, the US and Portugal's drug decriminalization. You really can't compare it. It's apples and oranges. Well, apples and oranges, two fruit of approximately the same size, shape, price, nutritional value, absolutely comparable. They demand comparison. And, you know, of course they're different, but we can learn a lot from comparing things that are similar, if not the same. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about the need for shrinkage as a guiding ethic in criminal justice reform in the United States. Uh, that's something that often gets lost sight of, believe it or not. There's a need for shrinking the American criminal justice system. Uh, you probably all know this if you have made it into this room, but the United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world uh, at about 693 per 100,000 people. Compare that to Canada, where it's 114 per 100,000, and Germany, where it's just 76. There's a great deal of variation in the United States uh, between our 50 states and Louisiana, uh, where they let the good times roll. The incarceration rate is uh, 1,143 
per 100,000, whereas in Vermont and Massachusetts, it's 347 and 330, respectively. There's an enormous racial disparity, as I'm sure you have read and heard, perhaps even witnessed, in the United States. Black Americans are about 13% of the U.S. Uh, population, that's one three, but make up about 38% of the incarcerated population, so about triply overrepresented. Uh, similar stat in Canada, I believe, where the, the stats that I found say that black Canadians are about 3% of the Canadian nation, but make up about 10% of the prison population, but a, a very large disproportion. Uh, and the number of indigenous people here who are incarcerated, making up about 10% of the Canadian nation. What's the good? And, but making up close to 28% uh, of the incarcerated population. Uh, I don't want to present this world historically high degree of punitive, punitiveness that we have in the U.S. right now as somehow the timeless essence of our nation, although it's sometimes tempting to do so because it's a relatively recent phenomenon rocketing up since the, uh, the mid-70s, uh, where beforehand in recent living memory, America's incarceration rate was certainly high compared to the EU countries and Canada, but not a whole order of magnitude higher, uh, but now things are different. There's a growing recognition, however, in the U.S. that this is uh, a problem that needs to be solved, something that needs to be fixed. That recognition is, of course, not evenly distributed throughout our political system or throughout our society. Uh, we have a president uh, and attorney general of, of the federal system uh, who uh, are you know, very uh, reactionary and running, ran their campaign in a way on a law and order campaign that was like a, a atavistic flashback to the 70s. And this is amid crime, violent crime rates that have been on secular decline since the early 90s. Uh, but at the state level, at the local level, and certainly at the level of think pieces, op-eds, uh, nonprofit foundations and universities, there's a strong recognition that our incarceration rate is a disgrace and that something needs to be done to, to lower it. And many things need to change so we become a less punitive society in the U.S. Uh, the question is, uh, what needs to change? And very often, criminal justice reform becomes a kind of expansion of the criminal justice system. Uh, let me give a few examples of both local and national trends from the United States. Uh, in New York City, we have homicide rates that are lower than they've ever been since reliable records were, began to be kept in the early 60s. Uh, you have a liberal mayor, Bill de Blasio, just reelected by a very comfortable margin, liberal city council, uh, and yet one of the first things that de Blasio did, uh, the mayor did in his first term, was to hire 1,100 new police officers. Uh, that's what he did with the, what you could think of as a peace dividend, hire more police. Uh, we have a new speaker of the city council who was just uh, elected a few weeks ago named Corey Johnson young at age 35, HIV positive, part Korean queer, and a fresh new voice in city politics. Central to his campaign for being made uh, speaker of the New York City Council was hiring more police officers. Uh, there is a vision that we can solve our problems and create social order without relying so heavily on police officers, but it is still somewhat marginal even to center-left politicians in a center-left city. Uh, another example of the expansion of criminal justice uh, as, as a reform mechanism, the Federal Department of Justice investigative report on Ferguson, Missouri, where the police killing of a young man, Michael Brown, uh, sparked riots with a heavily militarized re uh, response that shocked not just the world, but even the United States very often, uh, looked into it and came up with uh, the solution that there needs to be a bigger police budget with a lot more training 
uh, both in dealing with people, implicit bias training, implicit racial bias training, uh, but that there needs to be an expansion of the police budget. Uh, and drug courts are a uh, magical solution that is touted right now. This is where center-right criminal justice reformers meet with center-left criminal justice reformers. A recent op-ed by Newt Gingrich, uh, former Speaker of the House, uh, conservative Republican, uh, Trump supporter, and Van Jones, a uh, black progressive CNN news commentator and leader of the Cut 50 uh, enterprise to cut the American incarceration rate by 50, co-authored an op-ed saying the solution is drug courts. Uh, and what this does, of course, is expand the criminal justice system to uh, incorporate more kinds of therapy, but always under the purview of the criminal justice system, uh, not in the Department of Health, but in the Department of Justice. And that difference is significant. Uh, I think this needs to be rethought, this tendency to reform and fix the criminal justice system in the US by expanding it. As the Austrian sociologist Rudolf Goldschied wrote about a century ago, the budget is the skeleton of the state stripped of all misleading ideologies. To paraphrase that, sometimes it pays to hit the ideological mute button on what people in politics are saying and just look at what parts of government are expanding, getting more authority, getting more money. And we see that many of these nice reform efforts, the sweet spot where center right and center left meet is an expansion of budget and authority. And the message that I want to bring to you, you probably heard it before, is that the real solution, uh, long term and very often short and medium term as well, uh, to our over-punitive society and our sky-high world-beating incarceration rate lies fundamentally in transferring massive amounts of budget and authority from the criminal justice system to non-punitive arms of the state. Okay, uh, and I want to talk ab about that. But uh, what we see more and more in the expansion uh, of the criminal justice system, in often in a humane way, into less coercive forms of regulating people and to intervene in their lives, is a kind of net widening, widening the net, and net widening are the terms of art used to describe this process by which people who might not necessarily have been caught up in the criminal justice system to begin with now are because the criminal justice system has assumed a kind of coercive therapeutic role through probation services, through rehab services, uh, and, and other kinds of you know, coercive therapy uh, that, uh, that are meant to you know, intervene after people have been caught or busted or arrested. Uh, there's an excellent article by Carl Takei of the American Civil Liberties Union from Mass Incarceration to Mass Control published in the UPenn Journal of, uh, of Social Justice uh, that explores uh, the problem of this and very often with uh, in strong incentives from private enterprises that are contracted by the government to perform these therapeutic services, but always contracted by the Department of Justice and by the criminal justice system. Uh, often they have an incentive to keep people in uh, their you know, system of, of taking urine tests, of showing up to mandatory treatments, uh, uh, you know, education classes, uh, and staying in as long as possible. And it's very easy for private firms to gain this. So even if there's a cash incentive or a monetary incentive provided by the state to get people out to keep people in, uh, the categorical imperative of any private firm is, of course, to make money. And that's just the amoral nature of it. I say that you know, without any condemnation, really. Uh, it's critical, I think, to focus on how to shrink the criminal justice system. Uh, there are a lot of sexy, interesting topics right now you know, that involve you know, flashy moving parts. Uh, 
in criminal justice system, but I'm not sure they address the, the, you know, the fundamental issue beneath it. Uh, uh, what we see uh, in Portugal, for instance, was a very successful effort, uh, deemed successful across the political spectrum, where dealing with illegal drugs uh, was pulled out by the roots from the criminal justice system and repotted, transplanted into the Ministry of Health. So now if you are caught shooting up in public there, you get a ticket or just information from the police where you are referred to the Ministry of Health. And you don't suffer consequences there if you don't show up. You aren't thrown back into prison if you fail a urine test. Uh, but instead, there is a well-funded, and it's essential that it be well-funded, public health approach there uh, you know, that will provide therapy to those who need it. And there is a clear distinction made between someone who might be caught you know, smoking hashish in the street and someone caught for the seventh time uh, injecting heroin as to what kind of response is needed. Uh, so it's not all agglomerated together needlessly. Uh, the criminal justice system, one thought, was supposed to shrink on its own accord with the economic downturn of 2008, but it hasn't really happened that way. And historically, that's not how things happen. Uh, first of all, prisons don't close on their own, and there isn't really much savings uh, for in in prison budgets unless you close either entire wings of prisons or shut down entire prisons themselves. This is because so much of the costs of incarceration are with overhead. Uh, and the average cost of a prisoner is much higher than the marginal cost, to put it in economic terms. Uh, so even if you, you, know, you know, empty your, in your incarcerated pump by 30%, which New York State has done since its peak, you might find that you're still spending just as much money as New York State still is. Uh, and some prisons have been reconverted, but uh, there's a strong uh, incentive uh, to keep you know, these jobs in rural communities where the prisons are increasingly shoehorned. And I want to point out that these are not private prisons, but usually public prisons. Uh, there's a mistaken emphasis in the United States uh, on private prisons as the driver of mass incarceration uh, and as you know, being the kind of monopoly money bags villain who's behind it all. And I can see psychologically why that is. It's kind of comforting to think that we have this horrible uh, and sadistic system uh, because a few people are making uh, big money off of it. I think it's truly disturbing to realize the fact that this is actually the result of the general political will, by no means unanimous and many people are against it, but this is a collective political choice that we in the United States have made. And although there are uh, some you know, financial incentives from the public sector unions of corrections officers uh, and other service providers, uh, only about 5% of our total prisoners in the US are in for-profit facilities. Now, the percentage is much higher in the federal system, and that gets weighed out, but only about 12 to 15 percent of the total incarcerated population in the U.S. is in the federal system. Uh, Washington's role in criminal justice in the U.S. is surprisingly, if you don't follow this, small. And right now, I would say thank God for that. Uh, uh, now, the stickiness of these economic incentives to maintain prisons and to keep spending, it can be overstated. Uh, it's true that for many rural, mostly white areas, this is you know, the main employer. Uh, but economists who have looked at the impact of prisons have not found that they are that enriching to a particular county or region and that many people, uh, uh, you know, when asked or provided with alternatives, would prefer to have other ways of employment than as a corrections officer. Uh, the husband and wife team of Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, a great scholar, and Craig, Wil uh, Craig Gilmore, uh, an organizer as well as an intellectual, have you know, done successful organizing campaigns in California around this issue, and it can be beat. It's not entirely hopeless. Uh, 
the challenge right now, I think, is to change horses in the middle of the stream and find other ways of maintaining a benign social order. I mean, actually, social order. I can't say the social order we have now is, is benign. But switching from a punitive approach to other arms of the state. And that is not easy. Uh, the social disorder caused by uh, you know, opioid, heroin, and fentanyl use in public is very real. Uh, it, I don't think anyone wants to see needles or you know, on their streets, dirty needles around or in their playgrounds. Uh, but in order for uh, this to happen, it, there needs to be not just a letting go on the side of the criminal justice system, but a picking up in the public health world and in the medical treatment world. Uh, and there needs to be will there and belief among public health professionals and bureaucrats at the local level that uh, harm reduction strategies can work. In the US right now, all eyes are on Philadelphia, which just elected in a landslide uh, a new district attorney who is utterly different from all the district attorneys who have come before, someone named Larry Krasner, who is a career criminal defense and civil rights attorney, uh, and already a, a large percentage of the, the career prosecutors have been let go uh, from the office since Krasner took office in January. And there's been an announcement that a safe injection facility will be opened up. Philadelphia is one of the cities that has the, the harshest problems with uh, fentanyl and heroin use. Uh, but part of the challenge there will be not just uh, instilling new habits in the police department and even the prosecutor's office to cease prosecuting these as, as drug crimes, but also to build up the capacity and the ability to treat fentanyl and heroin users uh, in a non-punitive way, in a way that is completely separate from the criminal justice system. Uh, we find looking at uh, uh, what affects crime and what can lower the incarcerated population that shuffling budget and money from one kind of, uh, of police activity to another is, is only a small part of it, that very often the solution lies into uh, diverting budget and energy to arms of government that are not punitive at all. Uh, for instance, employment. Uh, the relationship between employment and serious crime rates is not straightforward. Uh, and the secular spike in violent crime in the United States between 1960 and the early 90s was often accompanied by tight labor markets. Uh, so it, it's not a is crystal clear and simple relationship. However, uh, University of Chicago just got very dramatic results published in the journal Science, which found a significant drop in violent crime uh, after a randomized trial that gave working class youth in Chicago summer jobs. Moreover, this drop in arrest rates for violent crime lasted not just for the summer, but for a full year and a half. So that's where money can go. Uh, expanding healthcare in general, not just drug treatment, also seems to correlate with a drop in crime, uh, as Brookings Institution just published in a meta-analysis by Jennifer Doliak. Uh, this is a double move in all cases, and it's challenging to change horses in the middle of the stream. Uh, and I want to differentiate what I'm saying, uh, the message I'm getting with the conservative libertarian view, which just seems to have faith in you know, ending policing and uh, ending punitive state approaches to these problems and just hoping for the best that either private corporations can, and can clean it up through for-profit uh, treatment services or that some mythical community will take over. Uh, we found that was not the case in the US with the massive wave of deinstitutionalization of people with mental illness, that in the absence of local treatment that was well-funded and well-resourced, uh, all this led to was a, a reshuffling of people from mental uh, institutions into prisons. And now the largest uh, mental institutions in the United States are the county jails of Chicago and Los Angeles, as the sheriffs who run those facilities are uh, saying at every opportunity to any audience. Uh, 
But uh, while we need to come up with not punitive approaches to mental illness, they have to be adequately funded and, uh, and planned out. Uh, and there are other strategies uh, to combat crime and to combat and preempt punitive state responses to this by funding some community groups, too, that do a great job at violent, uh, violence prevention. Patrick Sharkey, chair of the NYU Sociology Department, has a fascinating new book out, and he talks about going to Perth, Australia, where he uh, spent a few nights traveling around with uh, the indigenous aboriginal uh, anti-violence groups that are not done on a volunteer basis, but are professionalized and adequately funded by the government. And uh, Australia has found happy results there in preventing arrests uh, and also preventing you know, what comes after arrest, very often deaths in prison uh, for uh, this vulnerable and at-risk population. Uh, always this is a double move. Uh, so I, I want to compare what I'm saying to a school of thought that is getting more and more attention, which is also good, and that's abolitionism, prison abolitionism, which you may have heard of. Uh, Angela Davis, uh, the veteran radical who continues to inspire many people, is the figure most commonly associated with that. And there's a, a metaphor here that prisons, just like slavery, can and should be abolished. Uh, I, I think this is a, an important and really essential uh, uh, school of thought, and it's a vision that feeds pra and nourishes practical work done by a growing number of people who work in prison reform, who work in the criminal justice system and social workers, uh, and who are doing you know, first-rate things. I think about the program administrator at the prison ed program where I taught a year ago is a prison abolitionist. I don't think it's unfair to say at the same time that the audience for prison abolitionism is never likely to be more than small. And small groups of people can, do, can be incredibly important and do essential things. And I say this, I want to make clear, not in any way to, to denigrate or cast dispersions on prison abolitionism. Uh, but I think there's a need to come up with a, a language for people who are not ready to embrace that metaphor that might be substantially the same, might be a little bit different, a, you know, a, little, a language that's a little blander. And I see that as part of my role as a journalist and, uh, and activist, too, to come up with that. Uh, now, why harp on the need for, to shrink the criminal justice system? Isn't it obvious and implicit in any project to reform the system? Well, as I have been telling you, I don't think it's obvious at all. And I think it's uh, something that can get lost surprisingly easily. Uh, certainly in the sweet spot of center left, center right uh, criminal justice reform, where as I have been you know, uh, giving examples. The, uh, so often, reform work is a kind of expansion where the criminal justice system can grow to include softer forms of social control rather than transplant uh, budget and authority to other arms of the state. Uh, but even in two of the other predominant lenses with which people view criminal justice and reform, uh, this, uh, this need for shrinkage can sometimes get lost. Uh, two of the, the most common ways to look at criminal justice reform in the center left and on the radical left too are seen, seen as a part of anti-racism and as a kind of legal reform. And uh, let me talk about those. Uh, anti-racism is an essential part of criminal justice reform in the US, given the racist disparities that exist at every level and the continuities uh, between slavery and violently enforced white supremacy uh, and our present day can be kind of in your face. Take the example of Louisiana State Penitentiary. It's on the site of a former slave plantation called Angola, so named because that's where m many of its slaves came from. And black men in bondage continued to farm that land. Uh, at the same time, uh, even though this legacy and 
and present day existence of violently enforced white supremacy is the largest single part, I think, of what determines our criminal justice overdose and overkill in the U.S., uh, I don't think it's more than half the picture, and there are more uh, than other things going on as well, and it's important to keep that in sight. Uh, first of all, when we talk about closing racial gaps and racial disparities in criminal justice uh, system of the U.S., it's not always exactly clear what we mean. Uh, take an immortal story from The Onion newspaper, white girl to be prosecuted as black man. Uh, very often, it's not clear whether we are going to close racial disparities by leveling up or leveling down, whether we're going to find an equality of dignity, treating everyone like you know, a, a well-off, upper-middle-class white teenager, or treating everyone harshly uh, like a working-class young black man. Uh, and that may sound strange, isn't it obvious we should treat everyone with equal dignity? It's not obvious in the United States. And in the Anglo-Saxon world in general, the post-Puritan English-speaking world, very often the leveling tendency has been to treat everyone uh, you know, to an equal degree of nastiness. And there's an excellent book by James Q. Whitman, uh, a law professor and historian of that, comparing the criminal justice regimes in Germany and France where uh, in the past aristocrats who were imprisoned for whatever reason were granted special privileges in jail. It was kind of like a, a hotel stay. And how those privileges slowly filtered down to include everyone. Uh, and so they're kind of leveling up. It may seem shocking uh, to you here. It certainly does in the United States to find that in Germany, not only can the great majority of prisoners vote, but they are actively encouraged to do so. And they get federal holidays off from their jobs uh, in prison. That's not how it is in the United States. Uh, it, lest this seem far-fetched in, in thinking about closing racial gaps uh, in the United States criminal justice system, consider the example of Minnesota which in 1992 uh, took it upon itself to close the sentencing disparity between uh, 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 for crack cocaine, which has mostly non-white users, and powder cocaine with mostly white users. And the state Supreme Court decided quite rightly that the sentencing disparity violated the state constitution against equal treatment under the law. How did they close it? By punishing uh, people caught with powder cocaine just as harshly as crack cocaine users. Uh, and uh, there are other examples like that. This is in the news now more and more because with the growing heroin and fentanyl crisis in the U.S., there's a myth in the U.S. that because a majority of the victims are white, we've somehow switched to a uh, public health paradigm in contrast to uh, the days of the crack wave of the 80s and 90s. Uh, and once in a while, one can read about a particular police department that has hired a couple of nurses or social workers and is inviting users to just drop in and get a referral. And these stories make our great dog bites man story, you know, human interest, but not at all representative of the uh, most common approach in our very large country, where there is still a great deal of punitive ferocity directed at, uh, at opioid users and heroin and fentanyl users. And it just doesn't make a very good feel-good news story when, say, some 19-year-old you know, you know, young white woman dies in a rural jail in Oregon you know, from a heroin overdose or going through withdrawal. But that's still a pro uh, very much a problem. We have not turned the corner to a public health approach at all. Uh, law reform is another way that uh, we tend to look at criminal justice uh, reform. And of course, we should, because law is important, needless to say. You're at Osgoode Hall. I don't need to tell you that. Uh, law is a big part of it. Uh, at the same time, I think it may not be quite as big as it seems. Uh, even sentencing law, which one school of thought gives overwhelming weight to in uh, explaining America's uh, 
incredibly large incarceration rate and prison population might not be the huge driver that it is. Uh, other scholars, particularly John Paff, an economist and law professor at Fordham, have noted that the big spikes in incarceration rate, in new admissions, and uh, and uh, overall prison pop uh, have not marched in lockstep with the, the imposition of mandatory minimums, that very often the determining factor is just the budget of the prosecutor's department. And uh, when a prosecutor's uh, office has more budget and can hire more staff and can afford to be more aggressive and there's been no comparable growth in the budget of the public defender's office, then that explains you know, the huge growth in, in higher and harsher sentences and higher charges uh, more than the new raft of mandatory minimums, which are certainly a big part of it too, but not you know, all-powerful. Uh, the lawyerly devotion to legal procedure can sometimes obscure substantive outcomes. Uh, the project of criminal justice reform in the U.S. and lowering our incarceration rate is a generational project and may turn out to be a multi-generational project. It's not going to be solved with just a single piece of legislation in Washington, especially given how disaggregated and hyper-localized American criminal justice, like U.S. government in general, is. Uh, but we can only wonder what criminal justice reform movement might look like in 30 or 40 years. I just think of what's happened to the human rights movement and human rights industry since its founding in the 70s. The fact that now uh, a major media outlet like Newsweek magazine can write about a human rights approach to drone assassination, uh, you know, where President, former President Obama's uh, author of a legal rationale for Jones was a le leading human rights lawyer just shows that you know once the eruption of a new reform movement cools, solidifies, uh, and institutionalizes, it can be put to all kinds of uses. Uh, and I think that it's not paranoid to be wary of what an institutionalized criminal justice movement uh, reform movement might look like in 30 years, and the need to stress always the substantive goal of not just clean procedure, uh, but also the need to shrink people under any kind, the number of people under any kind of supervision, uh, whether it's directly carceral or whether it's some kind of extra carceral monitoring of the criminal justice system. I mean, lawyers like law, law professors love law, but the solution is not always more law. Uh, I want to close by just telling you some of the questions on my mind about this, some directions I want to take this, you know, in my own writing of op-eds, think pieces, and perhaps some scholarship. Uh, institutions in general grow more easily than they shrink, and they don't like to shrink. So what are some examples of this? I was at the Al Jube Prison Museum in the gorgeous Alfama neighborhood of Portugal a year and a half ago. And, uh, it, this prison, uh, this building had been a prison for centuries, probably on and off for over a millennium. Aljube is the Arabic word for a dry cistern, which is also a more vernacular word for dungeon or prison. And it was been used as a prison on and off uh, uh, and eventually for political prisoners who resisted the, the Salazar regime. And to me, that just shows how difficult it is to shut down a prison. Not impossible, but difficult. Uh, what are some successful examples or even failed examples of decarceration? Uh, the US right now is up there world historically as one of the most punitive regimes and one of the most carceral states in world history, up there with legalist China in the fourth and third centuries BCE and late imperial Rome from the third to fifth centuries uh, common era and the peak Gulag Soviet Union. Uh, now, late imperial Rome's punitive state apparatus collapsed with the empire, and I wonder if that's what it might take someday in the United States. More happily, let's look at the Soviet Union. Uh, and, and where there was a real emptying out of the gulag after the death of Stalin. I want to know more about this. Was there resistance to decarceration? 
was there an attempt to repurpose the punitive apparatus there? I'm sure there was. But by uh, the end of the Soviet Union and the, the last two decades of it, their incarceration rate was significantly lower than the contemporary American incarceration rate. And you know, that should give any of us Americans pause. Uh, you know, there are many indexes of a society's freedom, but I think the most important one is not just the rhetoric and the blah, blah, and the ability to start a new business, but how many people are getting locked up. I think that is the highest consideration. Uh, another object of study is an object lesson in failure, but that might shed some light on how to decarcerate, is the failure of the U.S. defense industry to convert to civilian needs after the Cold War and its end. Now, many foreign bases in Europe in particular have shut down by the Department of Defense and its budgets have not at all collapsed and they are higher than ever. And instead you have a kind of supply-driven threat inflation. Uh, what can we learn from that object lesson in failure? You know, uh, it, you know it, to you know, be equipped to face the challenges because any kind of punitive apparatus does not shut down by itself. I asked the police chief of Camden, New Jersey, an impoverished city very close to Philadelphia, uh, if he thought you know, that it was his police department that was really best equipped to deal with mental illness and drug use, which is you know, a large part of what police departments do nowadays. And he said with great weariness, and I think with real compassion too, like, oh God, don't get me started. I mean, if you can't medicate it, you incarcerate it nowadays. And then when I asked him, and there was a former police chief of Tampa Bay, Florida, well, do you think then that, you know, these police department's budgets should be gouged and that budget should be transferred to the public, you know, Department of Public Health? They suddenly got, well, I wouldn't say that, you know. And, you know, there's an absolute need to do that, to have that strategic shift of budget and authority away from the punitive arms of the state to the non-punitive arms of the state. I don't think this is totally hopeless. I mean, there have been several prisons that have been converted you know, all around into museums or condominiums or just left to rot. Uh, and the Aljube prison uh, in Lisbon, which I visited, is now a really great museum dedicated to the victims of fascism and to uh, the anti-colonial struggle against Portugal's surprisingly long-lived African empire and, uh, and that struggle. So it can be done. It's not hopeless. But I think always with the eyes on the prize. And that's not just uh, uh, short-term transfer of people from prisons to other forms of monitoring by the criminal justice system where they're at risk to be thrown back into prison uh, you know, with a, just one fa you know, missed appointment or failed urine test. And even you know, when we look at the very new pressing need for uh, closing racial disparities and for law reform, we've got to keep our eyes on the prize of actually shrinking the whole system and finding a benign social order uh, in other forms of governance. I'd be happy to take questions now, and please introduce yourself if you don't mind, because I'd love to hear about you know whatever you guys are doing too. Thank you. Oh, we have a, a roving mic. Good. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Michelle. Thank you very much for coming. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, earlier on, you mentioned that the emphasis on private prisons and their hand in growing the criminal justice system is often overemphasized. I was wondering, how would you situate the, the larger prison industrial complex in terms of you know, lobbying groups um, that are meant to represent prison guards and other mm -hmm. support staff, as well as the industries that create you know, textiles and supply mm -hmm food for these prisons? Because uh, I understand that a lot of even government-run prisons award these contracts mm -hmm. out. So how would you situate yeah. those groups within this topic of the growing criminal justice system? I, uh, I think it's essential to look at these lobbying groups and their interests, without a doubt. And I, I uttered that word of caution not to dismiss, but just so that 
too much weight is not placed on specifically on private prisons. Uh, but as two scholar, two notable scholars, Marie Gottschalk, G-O-T-T-S-C-H-A-L-K, and Ruthie Wilson Gilmore have shown, uh, these economic interests are not insurmountable. Uh, they're sticky, but they're not bolted in. Okay, and uh, and it's always about offering people who are benefiting uh, from these incentives with some alternative. A hell of a lot of corrections officers don't like their jobs, and if they could get you know a comparable wage doing something else, they would jump at the chance, you know. Uh, and it, it's about offering something better. I mean, and I am pushing, this requires government spending. I'm not gonna pussyfoot around that. That's essential. And, uh, you know, prison reform is much easier in a social democratic context overall, whether we're talking about the services you're providing prisoners or whether, you know, alternate means of employment that you are offering people who currently benefit you know, at the wage level or the career level from the uh, carceral system. But Marie Gottschalk in particular, somewhat skeptical of the notion or the, the phrase, a dash industrial complex, you know, which is uh, I, the military industrial complex, really the, the er father of that, you know, and it's very useful for some things. Uh, but it's maybe obscures some things as well as cogently uh, clarifies them. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, I mean, these, these incentives, I, I think very often, though, it's a political choice. And uh, the culture of punitiveness in the United States is something that's really grim. I think the way to overcome this culture, though, it's not by individual conversion of people through, like, missionary. I don't think that's how you change people's heads so much, is by changing laws and institutions. And the two move in lockstep. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's not easy, any of it. Yes, could we get a mic? Thank you for your presentation. As you were speaking, I was thinking of so many, many things, especially when you mentioned Angela Davis. And I recall the time as a little girl wanting to run away and join the Black Panther Party. And mm -hmm. she had the big afro, and it was all inspiring. And uh, we understand now her history with the prison system. But uh, I wanted to ask you your thoughts about, uh, you mentioned underlying causes. And I'm interested in hearing more about um, the underlying causes for not advancing towards some of the changes you've highlighted, mm -hmm. such as what we have observed, say, in Australia, where different systems uh, um, of justice are taking place and are proving to be highly effective for marginalized groups. So I'd like to hear more, um, maybe some more examples of why that transformation isn't taking hold. Yeah. Although in Western, you know, in Canada and the United States, we're making these observations, but yet not gravitating towards them. And the second thing I wanted to comment on or to hear your thoughts about is um, Professor Derek Bell, mm -hmm. um, a famous legal scholar, talked about this model of um, interest convergence. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the um, theories in critical race theory to help um, explain um, why change is so difficult. And he drew our attention to the idea of um, when we try to eliminate segregation, for example, mm -hmm. it, uh, that did not um, take hold until white power elites saw that um, with the hoses and the police and the um, protests in the streets began to erode America's value proposition <coughs> of being the greatest liberal democracy on earth, when the whole world was seeing that it was not so in the mm -hmm. light of day, um, it wasn't until that erosion started to take place that there was a move towards really desegregating schools. It wasn't the idea yeah. of people, liberal, good liberal intentions, you know, yeah. paved the way. So he had this model that it was due to interest conversions. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if 
that type of um, model can apply to the prison reform that you're speaking of uh, in terms of its abolition, much like the abolition of segregated schools and mm -hmm. Brown versus Board of Education in the US. Yeah, thank you for two great questions. I'm gonna answer the first one and then I'm going to undermine my own answer. So what are the, the kind of you know, underlying things that make reform so difficult and that really led to this you know, cancer-like growth in punitiveness and prisons and, puni and state punishment in general in the US? I mean, the three long durée answers that people give up and come up with frequently are, you know, the, the history in the United States of violently enforced white supremacy, you know, first by slavery and then by the descendants of slavery. Jim Crow, and that, now that's something that's summed up in, uh, you know, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. I don't know if that book has been, uh, is tremendously popular and galvanizing. In, here in Canada as it has been in the US. Also, the fact that the US is a settler colonial society, like Canada, I think you all know what that means, but there's, a, you know, that it kind of gets a lot of violence into the, the cultural DNA of a society. And third, uh, the kind of uh, a puritanical uh, cultural attitude where equality means leveling everyone down and always laying, you know, cutting down the mighty and degrading people. So that's the, you know, this uh, equality of abjection uh, that we see uh, not happening at all in other, you know, Western countries, you know, like Germany or France, where there's been a leveling up. Now, what undermines the value of these three long-term, you know, cultural or long durée explanations is that it's only until the late 70s in the United States that you have this, you know, violent spike in incarceration. And all those three explanations, they were valid 50 years ago, you know, 100 years, where, 100, where our incarceration rate was always higher, but still comparable to say Finland or Germany. Uh, so there's something new in the past 40 years. Now, Michelle Alexander sums up a story that many people find very compelling, okay, uh, in her book, The New Jim Crow, uh, and that's that there's a backlash, a white backlash to the gains made by black Americans in the civil rights movement, and since, uh, you know, slavery and de jure segregation are now illegal, there's a turn to incarcerate them, you know, through, uh, uh, you know, disparate treatment under drug laws in particular. And that's kind of the common sense explanation among American reformers. It's an explanation that has deep flaws in it though, or, you know, deep problems. There's an excellent uh, essay, which you may well be familiar with by James Foreman Jr. Uh, in the New York uh, NYU Law Review uh, with a wealth of information. And he points out that there's some truth to that for sure. I mean, there is disparate enforcement of drug laws. I mean, marijuana use rates among white people and black people in the US are pretty much the same, but the arrests are much higher for marijuana. But still, even if you released every single nonviolent drug offender in the US, the US would still have the highest incarceration rate in the world. I want, I'm gonna say that again, because that's something that's outside the common sense of reformers in the US or, you know, the, but even if you locked up every nonviolent drug offender in the US, we would still have the highest incarceration rate. Now, nonviolent drug offenders are anywhere between, you know, it varies a lot from state to state. It's about 20 to 25% big piece of the puzzle. It's not a reason not to let them out, you know, uh, but that is not the driver or the only driver by any means. And Foreman also points out and this is leading to your second question, that you have the same giant spike in incarceration even in states of, of the Union where there are very few black people. Idaho, Wyoming, Oklahoma. Oklahoma is one of the most punitive states and it's, it's not the dynamic there isn't, the, the racial dynamic is more, maybe more indigenous and white than black. 
you know, it does have a history of anti-black racism too, you know, but, uh, it, but even the incarceration rate for white people has skyrocketed too. So interest convergence, I mean, I, the politics are, are, are tricky because in, in difficult and take some finesse in navigating and take a lot of tact and coalition building because first of all, what tends to motivate people is morality or a moralized sense of their own interests or their own wrongs. And it's really important to you know, listen to that and, and honor that. Uh, but uh, there has to be, you know, there has to be room for interest coalitions to build too. And I was encouraged uh, greatly by a tweet I just saw by someone who's running for governor of Maryland and has an excellent chance of being the next governor on the Democratic ticket. Uh, and uh, he's a former president of the NAACP. His name is Benjamin Jealous. He's someone who was into criminal justice reform before it got discovered by the foundations, before it was cool. And he, he wrote out, I can't remember the exact words, was like, you know, it's horrible. We have the highest uh, black incarceration rate in the world. It's shocking. But guess what? We also have the highest white incarceration rate in the world. Uh, and let's work on this together and end it. And I thought, wow, you know, this guy's going to win. Uh, and and, and it, it's, it's tough because uh, how can I, you know, put this? Uh, you know, for many liberals and left of center people in the United States, the, the predominant sin and problem with our criminal justice system can, is summed up in two words, racial disparity. Okay, and that certainly is a problem. But a, I can guarantee that the bulk of white people will not be that interested if they say, oh, well, it's a black problem. Okay, well, then black people can solve it. Uh, only if there's a, a realization that this is also a problem that is harming a lot of white people too. And you know, I, I, it's unfortunate that's, that it's that way, but that's really how it is. And waiting for a kind of anti-racism, you know, enlightenment to come, an anti-racism rapture, that's not a political strategy. So, so I think that, he, you know, if I remember correctly, Derek Bell, he, he doesn't, he, for him, this interest convergence theory is somewhat pejorative in nature. I mean, he points out that this was utterly self-interested. And, you know, it was to a high degree self-interested. And by Cold War logic, too, if you're trying to, you know, win hearts and minds of post, you know, de recently decolonized non-white nations, and they're seeing what Bull Connor is doing on TV, you know, you, you know th there was major pressure from the State Department to, you know, step this up. This, this has got to stop. Uh, but I think there needs to be more politics of interest in the United States and finding that interest and couching it in language that gives people an on-ramp to it. You know, people who are not already there is very important and very tricky and very challenging, but it has to be done. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Brennan. Um, so at the very start, we talked about how not only is this a right-wing position to take up that um, incarceration is, or not incarceration, but the expansion of the criminal justice system is pos is a good thing. Uh, we spoke of Bill de Blasio calling for uh, 1,100 new police officers. Um, in that sense, it's undeniable that it is a politically popular thing to expand the criminal justice system. Uh, certainly in the U.S. Is, that, is there a reason that you think for that? Like, how does the U.S. compare to elsewhere in terms of maybe a public perception of danger and the imminency of that danger such that mm -hmm. it may feel that you can't wait for a health policy to take effect? Yeah. I need someone to keep my child from being the next fentanyl overdose. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's not so much that the fentanyl overdose is part of it, uh, but I think it's because the fact that even though the U.S. has a fairly low homicide rate now compared to the past 40 years, uh, it's still higher, a lot higher than in Germany or Canada or Japan. And there are a lot of guns. 
And we're heavily mediatized society, I think probably more so than in other OECD nations. And the cable news cycle is all about constantly drumming up fear of, of violence and violent crime. And the amount of public ignorance in the United States that results is staggering. I mean, I, there was a recent poll by Chaplin Univer Chapman University that found that you know over half the U.S. thinks that crime, violent crime, is getting is worse than ever and still getting worse. When in fact, it's been on a secular decline since the '90s. I mean, and this decline has been uneven. Uh, and I can see why people living in Baltimore or the West Side of Chicago might say, yeah, things are worse. But overall, the U.S. is, is much safer than it's been. So I think media, and, and not just in the kind of junk uh, tabloid media, media and, and, and cable news media, but even the quality media, the reporting on crime is frequently very innumerate. And the struggle for real criminal justice reform is a struggle for numeracy, too. Uh, the idea that, oh my God, you know, crime just went up, you know, 30%, you know. Well, there's a need to know about base rates. If you're starting from a very low rate, then a 30% increase in, you know, over the month before is kind of meaningless. When you're talking about low incident events, uh, you know, a, a large spike is kind of meaningless. I mean, as John Paff, a very empirically minded economist, law professor I mentioned earlier, right? Generally speaking, the larger the number of increase, the smaller the real increase and the more meaningless it is. Uh, so, and, and also, I mean, I think that if, if to a large degree, people don't know what they want. And the vision of a social order that is less heavily reliant on police and law enforcement is not been forcefully presented enough. And I think it is slowly entering the mainstream. And I think 10 years from now, things will be different for the better. And I'm greatly encouraged by the way, by the fact that uh, many urban district attorneys races have been politicized in a good way. Uh, I don't know how it is in Canada, but prosecutors in nearly all of the 50 states of the US are elected. It's a political position that wields immense power. It's not just a, you know, being a, a technocratic jurist system, it, you're elected. And the fact that prosecutors in big cities in particular are under real pressure to show now that they do not want to lock people off, that they want to find alternatives to punishment uh, is very encouraging, especially with the election of Larry Krasner in Philadelphia. Uh, this is something genuinely new, a major American city with a prosecutor who has a, a vision uh, of criminal justice that is fundamentally different, not slightly less bad, but fundamentally different from what came before. Um, so I, I, I think you know, the heartbreaking thing about de Blasio hiring new police and the new city council speaker agitating for more police is, I, don't, I think they could have gotten away easily without doing it. I think it was more preemptive uh, to preempt any possible criticism rather than a response to public demand. And I think we're at a, a kind of a turning point there. That talk was really great, thank you. Um, is this on? Okay. Uh, so I think a lot, my name's Daniel, I, I think a lot about the relationship between culture and ideology on the one hand and institutions and laws on the other. And I, I agree that the sort of meaningful changes that we're uh, looking for here need to kind of be inscribed in, inst in laws and, in, and sort of encoded in institutions. But of course, it's very hard to do that um, when we have like a sort of spectacular media cycle that, mm -hmm. um, as you were just saying, you know, sort of uh, capitalizes on crimes of the worst magnitude and often talks very uncritically about them. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, like I'm persuaded by this idea that this sort of, uh, you know, punitive impulse in American culture precedes some of the kind of material or economic, um, you know, uh, things that have that have shaped it, you know, sort of like Roger Lancaster's argument about like the punitive turn preceding the sort of neoliberalization of the of the market of the culture mm -hmm. or of the of the economy in the early 70s and late 60s. Um, so my question then is that when when you have this sort of 
cycle of uh, attempts to, uh, you know, sort of intervene in laws and institutions, and then this like unbelievable reaction um, in sort of like spectacular crime, public sort of, you know, like there, there's a retrenchment of sort of like punitive impulses in the, in the public because of like, oh my goodness, we're all in danger. Um, you know, Me Too is part of this in certain ways, right? Like that kind of like feeling that a violent crime is everywhere, it is stranger danger, um, mm -hmm. and we need to be protected, right? So um, my question is, like, do you think, I mean, well, uh, what do you think are the relative merits of trying to intervene uh, as a sort of, d directly as a, in a sort of single issue kind of way um, the way that abolitionists can sometimes err on the side of doing in criminal justice reform. And to what extent do you think that this needs to be connected to a, a broader kind of interest-based politics that seeks to, you know, sort of reestablish the terms of the social contract in America on, let's say, like social democratic, on a social democratic mm -hmm. basis um, through things like progressive taxation and you know Medicare for all and whatever mm -hmm. that aren't as highly spectacularized mm -hmm. um, as criminal justice reform per se. Yeah, well, I think you need both. You need a full spectrum attack on this. And criminal justice shrinkage, you know, will be a lot easier in a social democratic climate. Okay, it's a lot easier to convince people that prisoners should be able to, you know, take classes and learn skills and, you know, have books and things if, and, you know, have classes if people outside the prisons have a right to those things too. It's a lot easier to convince people that prisoners should be entitled to Medicaid expansion and quality state provided health care if people outside the prison have those things too. I mean, this may seem shocking to you, but you know, there, a lot of people resent prisoners in the United <laughs> States. I, and when I taught, I taught a year ago a course at a medium security prison, and it was great. My students were just wonderful. They, were man, they had just the best manners, and they had you know, great attitudes, always did the reading. And I missed them. And I, they were great students. And, and I just saw five of my former students last week because they've since been released. And, you know, they're all smiles and, and taking, you know, enrolled in, at either at NYU or Columbia and, you know, working jobs. And it was just great to see them. But, you know, I, going up to the prison, some of the corrections officers, you know, were super nice. Like some of them, they could fit in this room and I wouldn't be able to guess that they're corrections officers. But then other guys, I'm thinking of one guy in particular was like a stereotype of the stereotype of the surly, beady-eyed, alcoholic looking uh, corrections officer. And I'd get like one foot out, you know, of the classroom at the end of the class and I'd hear, so how is this gonna help them get a job? <laughs> why, why do they deserve this? My kids can go to college, you know? And, and, you know, th this resentment, you know, it's, it's bound to happen, though. It's entirely predictable in a nation where health care is not a matter of right and people go bankrupt paying for it, uh, where, you know, the social contract is shredded and frayed on many ends. I mean, this is the reason why in Norway, you know, Germany, where there's a very thick universal welfare state, uh, you know, politicians can offer or, you know, you know, high quality services and, you know, rehabilitation activities, whitewater rafting trips to prisoners because, you know, other people can do those things too. So uh, I, I, I don't know. To answer your question, I, I think you need both, but I, I, and, and I, I'm always happy to work towards common ground with center-right uh, criminal justice reformers whose main issue is fiscal conservatism, with libertarians who are great on many civil libertarian issues but also tend to be extremely fiscally conservative, would privatize their own grandmothers if they could, and, and also Christian conservatives who have their own vision for how things should be, you know? And I, I wrote a cover story for a right-wing magazine interviewing the former head of the largest prison ministry in the United States, which now has a policy advocacy wing that's all about shrinking the criminal justice system. Uh, interviewing, and there's, there's common ground to be found. But 
you know, common ground doesn't mean complete overlap and you capitulate. And I think anyone left of center, and I think even people right of center, should do some rethinking about the direction of the consensus of criminal justice reform, which as I was talking about leads to just a kind of a marriage of the culture of punishment and the culture of therapy with you know, the, the, the punitive state apparatus still being in charge. That's not something, it's not a road we wanna go down because this could be path dependent, as they say, and in 30 years, God knows how dystopian, even more dystopian that could look like. Uh, so yeah, yeah, all, all of the above, I know that's not a great answer. We do in real life have to prioritize things, political energy and time and, and budget, you know, has to be prioritized. Uh, but there's room for a lot of approaches. Another question. Yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to know what prompted you to put this magnifying glass on this topic? And second of all, how do you account for writing for these right-wing magazines, these publications? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, I, this first whole concept you know, was like a seed planted in my mind. When I first started practicing law, I worked at a community center, nonprofit in a Spanish-speaking immigrant part of Brooklyn, you know, very working class. I would say back in the 80s and 90s, it would qualify as a slum. Now it's a working class neighborhood. I mean, it's uh, doing much better. But going to the local high school, which my institute, you know, my nonprofit group had a relationship with, they had metal detectors. And I was told by students there that the metal detectors were useless, they're intrusive, the guards are jerks. It's a terrible way to start the morning and it's easy to get anything past it if you put your mind to it for half a second. Uh, and I was told the same thing, not only by the students, but by a teacher or two, and even by a vice principal. So what's the point? Why do we have this over-policing if, yeah, and you know, one of the things I did as a lawyer you know, for this group was looking at alternatives to metal detectors and police personnel in a school. How can you get social order in a school, a, an orderly, a benign order for learning without these things? And I found you know, four or five other schools with very working class demographics, I'm not talking about the prestige you know, public schools, uh, but working class demographics where the, the administrators and teachers at these schools had found you know, a different path where they almost in a ritualized way were emphasizing mutual respect, uh, order, uh, but in, in giving students a voice in how the school was run, sometimes in kind of a tokeny way, but still in a respectful way. And these schools had better disciplinary records, you know, with far fewer suspensions, better attendance records, better four-year graduation rates, because it was not the police personnel running the school. And you see this in New York every, you know, year or two, things have gotten a bit better because you know, I'm not the only one who is noticing this, but that, you know, a, a third grader, like an eight-year-old would be handcuffed in school for freaking out and having a tantrum. That is obviously the wrong way to deal with it. And I'm not saying it's easy to deal with kids. Anyone who's worked in a school knows. <laughs> You know, teenager, I'm not weird. I don't like some teenagers too. Teenagers can be, you know, a pain in the ass. There's no, no doubt. But there's a better way than treating people like potential criminals every single morning and having them. And not only do you have that, but you'd have every year or two instances of a teacher or even a principal also getting arrested <laughs> after trying to intervene if a, a security guard I mean, this isn't something that happens every day. I don't want to paint too bleak a picture or a sensational picture. Uh, so, you know, the nonprofit group that I worked for teamed up with other nonprofit groups. We had a big youth wing and they were doing, you know, agitation about this. Uh, and, you know, finally the big, uh, what it took was more transparency. Now, transparency does not always work. Very often it's, you know, nothing. But if an institution is capable of being shamed, then it can work. And once the, the Department of Education in New York, which has 1.1 million students, it's like the population of Estonia, you know, 
it's huge, uh, complicated bureaucracy. But once they started publishing it and people saw the number of, you know, 12 year olds getting handcuffed, they, they were shamed into changing things. And it's a slow process, but there's already real results there. Anyway, reading about that has got me thinking about, well, why are we trying to solve all our problems in the US by throwing police and prosecutors and prisons at them? And that's something that I've written about, you know, the over-policing of sex even, you know. Uh, you, you know, in a group that's even less popular than sex criminals, uh, white collar criminals, bankers. I think that there's this belief that you can prosecute your way to a just economic order. No, you can't. I mean, that, that's just reinforcing this bad apple system in the US that Wall Street's actually a wonderful place. And the financial system is perfectly fair, except for people who criminally abuse it. And Donald Trump, well, yeah, like that. But you know, the, the problem is bigger than just criminal abuses. There are some things that are very wrong that are not criminal. There's a kind of regulatory capture. Uh, right now, the whole immigration system has become devoured by criminal law. And you have criminal law encroaching and displacing and colonizing other areas of law. And, and, you know, and that needs to be checked and rolled back. Uh, and uh, so I, I've been writing for one conservative magazine since 2009, mainly starting about foreign policy, because believe it or not, there is a minority of conservatives in the U.S. who are very anti-war and think that the U.S. should not be constantly acting as the world's policeman and are against the humanitarian wars that Democrats often like to do. Uh, whether in Libya or the escalate, Obama's escalation of the Afghan war. And so finding a new audience there is, is a good way to, to write. I mean, I, I do believe in coalition building and finding converging interests when you can. And, you know, I, I, I have dirty hands with this and I wouldn't trust anyone who doesn't have some, you know, some dirty hands a little bit. Mm, mm, mm. Um, yeah, I was going to pose a question. I can't help but think, as you speak, um, sorry, my name is Eric uh, from Political Science. So let me ask a Marxist question. So I'm representing mm -hmm. the Department of Political Science. Do that mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. So one word that I thought of as you were speaking is is pacification. Really, I mean. Yeah. It, it's not just that this is targeting crime specifically, but that these mechanisms, these state mechanisms, are ways of, of like even just governing the population. But what, why is it now that, so you spoke of this, the moment in the 70s and the spike in violent crime, which accompanied um, an economic slowdown and depression, right? Why is it now that we have increasing inequality, but violent crime has decreased? Yeah. It, and it's even more complicated than that because the spike in violent crime really starts in the early 60s where you have a booming economy, you know, uh, largely up until the mid 70s. Uh, so yeah, I, I, the connection between violent crime and full employment is something that is not straightforward. Okay, it's not straightforward. You have other things going on, you know, in the US, you have massive social dislocation and then reimplantation of the great migration, you know, from the south to the north, the like working class African Americans whose treatment in the north is, you know, not always so welcoming to say the least. And uh, does anyone, surely some people must make the argument that the reason that there is, it, that the fact that there is less violent crime actually vindicates uh, this overwhelming growth and spending, yeah. right? It, it, in other words, there's less because it's worked. Yeah, no, that's a very common argument that, well, you know, you criticize the carceral state, but hey, crime's down, but draw the connect. But, you know, and other, you know, social scientists have tried to piece out just how much of the drop in crime can be attributed to incapacitating you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And surely some of it can be attributed to that. I think you, you can't, it would be wrong to just deny it categorically, but you also have to ask what's the opportunity cost? How could crime have been prevented in a way that doesn't 
shred the social fabric and I, just wreck I, entire You give an incredible panoramic uh, view of this, and I, I sense that there's a lot of puzzles that you still feel aren't resolved. Like, these general theories just don't seem to work. But let me just pass this to Yeah, I mean, let me, let me point you to, to, to some writers who are looking at the political economy of this. There's Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, Christian Parenti, Loic Wacan, of course, a famous one, who have all looked at you know, the, the explosion of American incarceration in the context of the neoliberal order after the Keynesian order and what, how it all fits together. Uh, I think it's important not to fit the Legos together too tightly, though, because I think you, you do have to look at, you've had different kinds of neoliberalization in other countries, in Canada, even in Western Europe, uh, where you don't have the explosion of incarceration. I mean, and, you know, the, the United States is just so aberrant and, from other advanced capitalist countries right now that, you know, which doesn't mean that maybe it's because America's, you know, capitalism is, has its American characteristics, but, you know, that's surely part of it. But anyway. Um, the, when, you, when you speak of the unhappy marriage, you know, right now between uh, that culture, of, like the therapy and the punishment side of uh, the criminal justice system, it made me think of um, how when, like when many speak of prevention, of preventative approaches, they use the language of like epidemiology. Mm -hmm. And so there's this like, b there's this turn towards, you know, big data policing. And, and, uh, and how some, like, it's being posed as a more effective or precise way of targeting crime before it, or neighborhoods before serious things happen. Um, but what, I mean, I've always wondered what the, <laughs> where you draw the line between that, which is often couched in progressive terms as, uh, and, um, and uh, just straightforward broken broken windows policing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, connected to that, to this to this um, idea of prevention and how we, like how we like somebody on the left would would treat these questions is like, I wonder like it always seems to come down to like a greater greater surveillance. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe fewer people thrown in jail, but just uh, this enhanced targeting will will just rely on like a surveillance of everyone. Like I don't really know how to reconcile these these two impulses in in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, un unfortunately, that's that's a very accurate view. I mean, one recent piece of federal legislation that Carl Takei T A K E I writes about in a great law review article came out last year is that uh, you know. If at the federal level, demands and legislation for lower mandatory minimums or fewer mandatory minimums are always washed down with an expansion of kind of outpatient surveillance uh, or of, uh, uh, you, know, you know, expansion of, of probation and the need for probation, and which often go to private companies. Uh, and the, the trick is to just I think make the right demand. It's it's not. We just need fewer people. Period. In the criminal justice system, we need to shrink the system. Period. While expanding other non-punitive arms, it has to be non-punitive. Uh, and in talking about decriminalization in Portugal, I mean, I, I talk to some people about that. Say, oh yeah, well we have drug courts here. That's kind of the same thing. Well, no, it's not. If if the, it's essential, even though this is like a boring thing, it's a question of bureaucracies and institutions. You have to pull all this out by the roots from the justice system and repot it and transplant it in the Department of Health, you know, the Department of Health and Human Services, what have you, and, and just transfer that budget and authority. You can't just expand in a softer but still very coercive way. Uh, and... It, I, I just think that we're at a point where center left and even center right advocates really need to wise up a bit about what we're, they're really pushing for.
Oh, and, and let me go back very quickly to Daniel. I mean, you were d despairing a bit about, well, the media does this. You know, yeah, there's the tabloid media with its angle, it's sensational. But, you know, universities have a lot of power. Law schools have a lot of power. The bar wields a lot of power. And to instill a totally different guiding ethic in, lawyer, in legal professionals of all kinds, in people with college degrees, all kinds, that has a real impact on the whole society. I mean, you know, the tabloid press does not always win. <laughs> yeah. yeah, hi, uh, Ben Fulton, third year law. And um, I noticed you uh, made some reference and, and were separating uh, violent drug offenders from nonviolent drug offenders. Um, and certainly I agree with your point that the way to decrease incarceration rates is not to have more legislation. Um, but I was just thinking about instances where the violence is committed as a direct result of the um, drug prohibitions, like if someone's resisting arrest for a you know, drug charge, I mean, the reason for that resistance was the criminalization mm -hmm. of the drugs they had on them, and also some of the uh, tertiary effects where uh, the criminalization of drugs increases their value to the point where a number of users, addicts, turn to um, property crime and other means, illegal means, of getting the money to support their habit, or where drug dealers engage in turf wars, again, as a result of the legislation. And so when you factor those um, considerations into the equation, the number of people incarcerated as a result of the drug prohibitions may be considerably higher. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the consequences of, of, of drug prohibition are large, and I don't mean to poo-poo them, and they probably are bigger than the you know, 20 to 25% who are in, strictly speaking, for you know, nonviolent drug offenses. But to back up a bit, you know, I, I make the distinction and talking because it's conventionally made, but I, I do very much want to include people convicted or charged with violent crimes uh, as people whose treatment needs very much to be reformed. And too often, uh, you know, nonviolent drug offenders are held up as kind of the poster child you know, for the, the deserving recipients of criminal justice reform. And sometimes those pieces of legislation are washed down with harsher sentences for violent criminals. And I think we overpunish violent criminals too much. We overdefine what violence is in the United States. It's very erratic from state to state in, in my country what counts as a violent crime. Uh, and uh, as you point out, circumstantially, resisting arrest, which police have a ton of discretion about what can count as resisting arrest, uh, can lead to that. Uh, same time, I don't think that uh, all violent crimes would go away if drugs were completely decriminalized. I mean, as uh, you know, one book, Ghetto Side, by Jill Leovy, L-E-O-V-Y, she writes about, it's a you know, very interesting book about the homicide squad in Los Angeles where the victims are mostly working class black and Latino men. Uh, you know, she, she points out that you know, one of the largest drivers of violence in any society, it's, it's violence is committed by young men who feel they have no prospects. And that's true whether or not you know, potentially something is criminalized. Uh, and until, you know, everyone, you know, every young man in particular in the U.S. feels that they have a chance at a, you know, you know, good living, good income and a place in society, you know, people that push to the margins are going to be committing some degree of more violent crime, you know. Uh, but I certainly agree. And I never meant to suggest that all violent crime would disappear if uh, drugs were legal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, so my name is Rahina, and um, I am a teaching assistant um, at the criminology department. Mm -hmm. So I thought this was really, um, really, I found this really interesting. Um, and I was 
I was tempted to invite my students this afternoon and then I forgot and then I came here and I was like, wow, this is so interesting. Um, I'm kind of glad they didn't come because then they would like, um, so then they would like, uh, um, I, I, I'm just, I was just concerned that they would, um, um, it would blow their minds. Yes. <laughs> yes. So where I was going with that. Thank you for helping me bring it home. Okay. Yes. So that was that's definitely what I was going. But anyways. Um, so to my to my um, to my question. Um, I think I found the, the talk very compelling, um, and I'm I'm deeply persuaded by your arguments. Um, I. I think my question relates to like where you were going with it, right? Um, and the comparisons you draw between um, the incarceration rate in the U.S. right now and um, the former Roman Empire hmm. and the Soviet Union, right? Um, and and I thought that was, you know, it was it was funny, but it was also um, um, uh, it was also interesting to see how uh, the incarceration rates have not gotten back to where they were. Um, at the time of the Soviet Union, and so the U.S. could draw some insights from that. But I also um, want to go back to the comment you made about apples and oranges, right? Mm -hmm. So they um, obviously don't have the same um, history that the U.S. has, and you have made the very um, important point that, that about how um, settler colonialism and violence and um, and violently entrenching white supremacy has been at the heart and the root and the, um, uh, uh, the, the core of, of criminal justice system. I just wonder if, if drawing insights um, from, for example, the Soviet Union is, um, is something that is comparable even, and if you've thought about how um, issues around race mm -hmm. would sort of complicate it for you. Yeah. Well, I, I comparable, yes. Uh, identical, no. Uh, I mean, I, I'm long overdue with the feature article for The Nation magazine, a left liberal weekly, about Portugal's drug decriminalization and what it offers the U.S. Of course, Portugal is very different from the U.S. Portugal doesn't have tons of handguns, like you know, barely any guns, uh, and that, you know, certainly alters how a Portuguese model might be transplanted or adapted. Uh, you know, I, it's essential to compare than to look, and I know that this. Some people are uncomfortable with this. And comparing doesn't mean you just impose it wholesale. You always have to adapt to local circumstances. Uh, and, you know, in the United States, the, the criminal, the politics of criminal justice is very much tied up with the politics of race, as you point out. Uh, but it's important to look at uh, the way that the politics, the criminal justice system affects, you know, racial attitudes and racist attitudes specifically, not just the other way around. I think too often in the United States, there's a, a fixation on racism as kind of this spiritual thing and only by individual conversion and like rebaptism can the whole nation escape from it. That's not how it's, it works. That's not how it's going to be overcome. Uh, it's going to be overcome by changing institutions and laws primarily. And, you know, we almost don't like to admit this, but, you know, who we are as individuals, our thoughts, our consciences, our feelings are very much affected by the institutions we deal with every day. You know, school, the workplace, uh, you know, our families, uh, other associations, you know. That's, and that's something that's much more amenable to change. Many Americans react very negative. Many white Americans, most white Americans, react very negatively to the imputation of racism. Like, and it's surprising how visceral that is. You would think people would be able to deal with it a little more while acknowledging, which you know, I think most people do, that the US certainly has a racist history uh, but, you know, whether it's the present, that's where people 
disagree about. And I think, uh, I mean, I would like to see the, the political movement for criminal justice reform to be as, you know, I was talking uh, with Yvonne who, who left for clock, just like she said, uh, you know, about interests and finding common interests as much as at the spiritual level, which I think as politics is not especially fruitful. Uh, I'm Peter, I'm an LLM student here. Um, I had a, well, first I want to thank you for such a great presentation and your thoughtful answers to all the questions that we've been peppering you with for over an hour now. Um, <laughs> so I, I wanted to ask about um, uh, what you see this being like 40 years from now, as you mentioned, and what kind of um, potential backlashes might exist. You mentioned that um, after the civil rights there may be, or there was sort of a backlash uh, I've, re I've heard it referred to as a white lash. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I guess one of the unintended consequences that comes to my mind of taking something out of the criminal justice system and putting it more in a health context is um, less due process. Uh, one of the unintended consequences might be that somebody on the right might say, well, this isn't prison. This isn't a criminal justice issue. So less due process is necessary. And we, we end up putting mm -hmm. a whole lot more people in the system. Um, based on that, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if, if you think that that's a concern or if there are other concerns that you think might be unintended consequences years down the road. I mean, that scenario that you just sketched out is, is very worrisome and it's a realistic scenario. But I think it, it points to the need to make the alternative, you know, non-coercive, okay? And a matter of free choice and treating people like adults guess what, if you treat people like adults, they're much more likely to act like them. I mean, like good adults, I mean. And, you know, it, the idea that people are gonna refuse to ever get any mouth, uh, medical care if you make it that the option, you know, or drug treatment, that's not really what you see in other countries. You know, it, you know one, it's, there's a lot of new, thinking and, and new paradigms that, that need to be spread around. And, uh, and the way you do that is through universities, through teaching, you know, uh, and changing laws and institutions. Uh, the whole concept of harm reduction is very new to most people in the United States. Harm reduction, you guys, some of you may know this, some of you may not. It's, you know, in the context of sex work and in drugs, the idea is you don't try to outlaw these things with their, you know, the baggage of social ills and problems they bring with it. You just, tr you accept it as a reality of life. There's a reason why sex work is called the second oldest profession. Uh, but you just try to make it as less bad as possible. Uh, and uh, for civil libertarian reasons, you know, for public health reasons. Uh, and, you know, this is news to a lot of people. People are not used to thinking like this. Even my students in a medium security prison were just baffled at first by even though many were, were locked up for drug related offenses, like harmed, you're, you're letting people have, have a safe injection? You're like giving people, why would you? I mean, but that's just hooking them on one drug, methadone or buprenorphine, instead of another. That's bad. The goal is to get them on drugs. Well, that's actually not true. You can be on methadone and hold a job, maintain normal social relationships with your family and with your friends. It's not great. No one said, but life is not great. And you know, <laughs> the, the human beings are a, what's the, the, the academic word? Are, we're a problematic species. I'm gonna tweet life. Okay, <laughs> and the idea that, you know, and I think in the United States, it's this blind worship of success and this internalized pressure that everyone should be rich and successful that is absolutely related to our you know, mass unprecedented punishment. They go together. The inability to accept failure, the weakness of the flesh. I mean, I'm an atheist, but I'm, I'm talking, you know, scripturally. The, no, the inability to accept the frailty of, you know, you know that is so much tied together. And, and I, I think it means, you know, I, I was just saying that it's not a spiritual thing, but I think by changing institutions, we need to change attitudes and a paradigm shift like that. And that's my best case scenario.
for this. But you know, we need to push it for it to be not just less coercive, but totally out of the criminal justice system. Transplant it, root and branch. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Fred. Um, I'm a researcher. We just recently actually um, submitted a brief on uh, Bill C-59, which, which uh, is a national security overhaul in Canada. It's going through the committee process as we speak, in fact. Um, and I guess uh, a question that I have is a great deal of policing in Canada today is predicated on prevention. Mm -hmm. And taking it further from something another uh, speaker said, or uh, somebody here, I think you, you had raised this. Um, so it's focused uh, on prevention, but not in the traditional sense that we understand prevention. It's a proactive form of prevention, intelligence-led policing, you know, which is very disruptive. And the danger of that is that it takes us out of the criminal justice system altogether, which is an evidence-based system, and puts us into a suspicion-based system, which is far worse. There's absolutely no due process of any kind. And so um, this is happening in Canada, uh, very much so. And uh, you know, senior, uh, uh, senior RCMP officer on his way out uh, made some very disparaging remarks about the judicial system in Canada. Um, and I won't repeat them here. I mean, they, they're, they're offensive. Uh, the, so I, I guess the, 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 the sort of uh, move, the move that's underway here in this country is towards that suspicion-based system and away from the criminal justice system. And I don't see that that is going, <laughs> that's, that's not actually working very well. So um, I wonder if you could sort of weigh in on that. Like, how can we reform criminal justice, um, but without completely exiting that system into that suspicion-based system where due process is completely gone? You know, I can, I can, I, without knowing the particulars of Canada, I mean, you've sketched it out, you know, a good, good summary, but I can offer the example of New York where you had uh, stop and frisk policing. Uh, for decades, it was started by Mayor Bloomberg, uh, where you had thousands and thousands of young men, mostly black and Latino, overwhelming majority, uh, very often in high crime neighborhoods, getting stopped and patted down uh, without any need for any concrete suspicion, you know, for uh, uh, over a decade. And this was described by the police themselves and by its conservative backers in the right wing think tank world uh, as essential for public order, as the way to get guns off the streets. Uh, as just being critical. Without it, the city will degenerate into violent chaos. It'll be like the early 90s again. Uh, there was a, a impact litigation challenge brought by the Center for Constitutional Rights, a blandly named, uh, coyly named, left-wing civil libertarian group uh, that successfully challenged this practice and stopped it. And at the end of Bloomberg's 12-year mayoralty. And what have the consequences been? The homicide rate is now lower than it was then. I'm not saying that's a cause and effect thing at all. I want to be clear about that. You know, I'm not saying this cause. But hell has not been unleashed. There's no sudden orgy of gun violence in New York. You know, a lot of these things that are tended out as being essential to public order that police are doing, whether it's, you know, the suspicion-based thing without much due process, like our stop and turn out to be not essential. 
not essential at all. I mean, it's odd, you know, it's interesting to study what happens when police go on strike or stage a work slowdown. You had this in Quebec a few years ago. Uh, there was a police slowdown about enforcing traffic violations. You know, how did that impact road safety? You know, and, and other kinds of public safety? You know, surprisingly little. You know, I think that police do have a role in enforcing traffic safety, but a lot is goes into, you know, driver education, good street design, things like that that are not you know, linked to criminal justice. Uh, in New York, the police department had uh, went into a bit of a pout when Mayor de Blasio, very early on in his uh, rule, you know, made some very anodyne comments about how he teaches his son, who's black, or mixed race, but, you know, you know, to have the talk with him, you know, that you should always be very careful with the police. And if you're ever stopped by the police, don't do anything rash because they might shoot, you know, which, you would think police want kids to hear that, but they took utter offense and they said they were only going to be doing essential arrests. Which, <laughs> you know, which forces some questions, doesn't it, you know? Now, what happened to crime during this period when the police were in a bit of a sulk, you know? Uh, <laughs> You had public, you know, there were fewer public order arrests, obviously, because police, but you had a, a jump in homicides, but it's not a jump that's statistically significant. Uh, I mean, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to insist on being numerate here, because if it's not numerate, I really don't want to hear about it, especially in a university. But when you have low incident events to go from, you know, five homicides in a you know, six-week period, to nine, that's that variation. I mean, it's sad that these people are killed, don't give me, but that doesn't tell you anything because it's, you know, the jumping around. So, uh, I, you, you, the New York did not degenerate into, you know, a mass riot or anything during this. So, I think pushing those examples of the times when, you know, uh, police tactics that were advertised as utterly essential in other places turned out to be you know gratuitous and and they're and just always be looking at other ways to promote a benign social order one more question i got i got less more in me come on <laughs> Yeah, I'm just starting to feel my oats are now. There, are, there, yeah. <laughs> uh, are there any other questions? And, and there's no questions. All right, uh, I and, wore and, you guys out. Well, that's good. You've been a lovely <laughs> audience. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. No, know. it's your show. <laughs> uh, clearly, but but you'll allow me to thank you for coming, uh, and if all of us to uh, join me in thanking you for giving such a riveting talk, Chase. Thank you.